Great Father in heaven, you have already blessed us exceeding abundantly above all we have asked or thought. And uh, dear Father, we expect even more blessings as in the coming hour as uh, your servant, uh, Elder Parmender, continues to present the message that is so pertinent to our salvation. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would pour out thy Holy Spirit upon uh, the speaker and upon your people who are listening. We pray, Father, for eyes to see and ears to hear. We pray for the anointing of the uh, eye salve that we may comprehend the deep things of God. We pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can turn back to your notes. This is page two. At the bottom of the page, clearing the way for the latter rain. I saw that none could share the refreshing unless they obtained the victory over every besetment, over pride, selfishness, love of the world, and over every wrong word and action. We should therefore be drawing nearer and nearer to the Lord and be earnestly seeking that preparation necessary to enable us to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Um, you'll, you'll notice at the bottom of the uh, paragraph, which is now top of the page three, it says the battle in the day of the Lord. This phrase, the day of the Lord, uh, if you're an Adventist, it, 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 people don't really concern themselves about the technicalities of that. Um, but once we start placing things on the line, it becomes critical to understand uh, what that term actually means. And, and the reason for that is because Ellen White's going to use that phrase in different ways. Um, it's a phrase that's taken out or taken from the Bible. Um, sometimes it's called the day of the Lord or the day of the Lord's vengeance. It has that kind of connotation to it. Um, and if you were to go to Isaiah or Zephaniah, uh, where it would say that day, might not say the day of the Lord, then almost exclusively it's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. This would be that day. Now that might seem relatively straightforward to you, um, but again this becomes problematic because the application of Jerusalem um, being destroyed in that day can be applied um, in two different ways. At least that's the way we would approach this problem. Um, let me place that up here. The easiest way I'll, I'll show you that is in the line of Christ. So, if we took the birth of Christ at 4 BC, this would be the time of the end. And if we were to go to 27, 31, and 34, then we could mark 70, and we could also mark 100. Uh, this is when John's at Patmos. Uh, the Spirit prophecy teaches us that uh, Christ came to visit him, and she says it was those, the second advent. Um, AD 70 is the destruction of Jerusalem. And in the Great Controversy, chapter 1, she's going to tell us that a destruction of Jerusalem typifies the destruction of the world um, at the end of the world. Um, therefore, this would be harvest that we're familiar with. Uh, AD 34 would be the stoning of Stephen, and 
Yeah, let's read the Bible passage. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. If ye continue, Colossians 1, 23, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, wherefore I, Paul, am made a minister. So you can see here in this dispensation, and Colossians is in this history here, so this would be Colossians 1.23, the gospel is taken to the whole world. So on that, on that scale, um, AD 34, the Stoning of Stephen, this would be uh, the Sunday law. I put Jerusalem up there, and this would be the close of probation. And this would be the beginning of Christ's ministry. And depending on how we were going to structure this line, I would suggest this was 9-11 uh, and 1989. And this would be the history of the former reign and the history of the latter reign. So this would be the history of preparation. So you can build a reform line using the agricultural cycle quite nicely in the, re in the history of Christ. And so what I'm saying is that the destruction of Jerusalem is uh, brought to view here, the day of the Lord or the day of the Lord's vengeance and you can find this in multiple Old Testament books, um, is referring to uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in the history of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the Babylonian Empire, but it can parallel the destruction of Jerusalem here in AD 70, which would be the close of probation on this line, at this scale. But more often than not, when we talk about the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, we don't use it in the context of the close of probation, which is uh, Daniel 12.1, we more often use it, um, I put close of probation, we more often use it as the Sunday law, which was Daniel 11 verse 41. And so the question is, which one is correct? So people, once, you, once they're faced with this dilemma, which is the correct answer? Is it 12.1 or 11.41? And I'm saying that you can make both applications. When you uh, use this application for the Sunday Law, you need to be careful how you approach that problem and the conclusions that you come to, but it's an equally valid application. But the primary one would be here, Daniel 12.1. You see that in the Great Controversy. Um, and if you're going to do that, then um, this would be the Day of the Lord, or the Day of the Lord's Vengeance from... Um, close the probation to the second advent. So hopefully we can see that. But let's just reread what she says here. Um, I saw that none could share the refreshing unless they, unless they obtained victory over every besetment, um, etc. We should therefore be drawing nearer and nearer to the Lord and be earnestly seeking that preparation necessary to enable us to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. So hopefully we can see here um, from this passage that the battle in the day of the Lord contextually is the same period as uh, the refreshing time period. So the refreshing is the day of the Lord in this context. And we've already discussed when the refreshing is. It's right here. The refreshing is the latter rain. So in this passage she's teaching us that the day of the Lord um, would actually be in this history. So I'm going to overlay much of that Old Testament prophecy. We haven't gone to any of those passages, but as I say, you can read them in many books. Um, this would be the uh, day of the Lord. But here Ellen White's making an application but that this also is the day of the Lord. So the question is, which one is it? Is it uh, this one or this one? And I'm suggesting that it turns out that both are correct and the day of the Lord begins here and stretches all the way through. 
So I want to make that uh, point that the day of the Lord is all of this history in two phases, part one and part two. It is left with us to remedy the defects of our characters, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples in the day of Pentecost. The latter rain will come... Uh, oh, uh, just let me comment on this one. Um, it says, Then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples in the day of Pentecost. Now, um, this is a bit deceptive when you use a compilation like this because you'd be inclined to think that what we've just read here from 5T follows on from the passage of early writings uh, page 71 and it doesn't really they've just taken small snippets and lined them up in the way that they want to line up so I just want to, re to recall that um, we can't really follow on from one paragraph to the next um, because it's not safe to do that so we have to take this as a standalone statement um, but what I want us to see here is that when it talks about the latter rain, she says that the latter rain equals the former rain. Hopefully we can see that. And this former rain is Pentecost in the time period of Christ. Uh, and she says it's, um, then the latter rain will fall upon us. And I'm saying that latter rain that's going to fall upon us is... Uh, this one here. So, although we haven't proved it, um, because I don't think we're going to have time to do that, I'm saying this is the history of the Sunday Law, uh, in the history of the 144,000. So, this latter reign is this period of time, um, and if that's the close of probation, I'm saying this is the Sunday Law, and she's equating these two together. So if we came back to our line here, then we, she's talking about Pentecost is lining up with the latter rain, and you can see that's what we've already laid. Um, in this passage, she's not talking about the sprinkling on Resurrection Day, but it's there, as is the former rain. If you take this history as a singular event compared to the latter rain, and it gives us the license to start investigating about this former rain. And you can see this former rain is being brought to view here. Um, it's being brought to view here. You can see in this history, in this context. So what we now then are forced to do is if this was a Sunday law, we'd want to look for this event here, this way mark. The latter rain will come and the blessing of God will fill every soul that is purified from every defilement. It is our work today to yield our souls to Christ that we may be fitted for the time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, fitted for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Keep the vessel clean and right side up. Oh, before I read this one, I just want to check something. We need not worry about the latter rain. All we need to do is to keep the vessel clean and right side up and prepared for the reception of the heavenly rain. And, keeping, and keep praying. Let the latter rain come into my vessel. Let the, line, the, let the light of the glorious angel, which comes with the third angel, shine upon me. Give me a part in the work. Let me sound a proclamation. Let me be a co-laborer with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so it's got the date there, 1891. And uh, it's, it's obviously what she's saying. Um, we don't need to worry about the latter rain. The, the reason she's making that statement is because people are agitated about the subject of the latter rain because this is in the 1888 period and, it, and the subject is coming up. Um, all we need to do is keep our vessels clean and the right side up. 
you can see the symbology there, so that they can catch the heavenly rain when it comes. It says, uh, let the latter rain come into my vessel, let the light of the glorious angel, which unites with the third angel, shine upon me, give me a part in the work. Now, I'm pretty sure most of us understand what she's referring to here. But to actually decode all of that, you'd have to go to early writings, page 277, paragraph 1. It's called the chapter, uh, The Loud Cry. Um, I don't think we'd have, we're going to have time to go through that, but I'd refer you back to a class that we did a couple of weeks ago. And we, and we go, no, I think it was a prayer meeting. Might have been in Vespers. Um, that we discussed um, the breakdown of that chapter. So what I'm saying is this. You've got the third angel's message running through history. And she says, let the line of light of the glorious angel, which unites with the third angel, shine upon me. Give me a part in the work. So I'm saying an event happens, and this angel comes down, and it unites with the third angel. And you get this, um, how does it say? It doesn't say anything, he just says that, you, that it unites with the third angel. Um, and the light that's going to be produced here is going to shine upon these people. So there's this angel here that's going to come down. Um, I think we're going to have to go to uh, early writings 277 just so I can demonstrate uh, what she's referring to there. Um, so you're not having to take my word for it. So this is Early Writings, page 277, paragraph 1. It doesn't have a chapter number, it's just called The Loud Cry. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven, descending to the earth, and again ascending to heaven, preparing for the fulfilment of some important event. So what, all I'm going to do is I'm going to give you my explanation of what's happening in this passage. So there's angels hurrying to and fro um, to heaven. I'm saying this is a symbol of Jacob's ladder. And these angels are going up and down uh, from heaven uh, to earth. And they're preparing for some important event, and that's the event that they're preparing for. Then I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth to unite his voice with the third angel. So, um, if you go to uh, page three in your notes, and you read that paragraph where it begins, uh, let the light of the glorious angel, which unites with the third angel, if you, if you read that as I'm reading from the early writings passage, uh, it says, Then I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth to unite his voice with the third angel and give power and force to his message. So I'm saying the language is, is virtually identical. It's the, same, uh, it's the same way, Mark. It's the same history. It's the same event. So this event here is what she's talking about. And it's obviously in connection with the latter rain. So there's an event here, and this angel, uh, we're going to see in a moment, is the angel of Revelation 18. And it's joining um, with the third angel. So that's what the scenario that's being built here. Um, Great power and glory were imparted to the angel, and as he descended, the earth was lightened with his glory. So that phrase there, the earth was lightened with his glory, is Revelation 18 verse 1. The light which attended this angel penetrated everywhere as he cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit. And it goes through the rest of the verse. So I'm saying there's the second angel is now going to combine itself with the third angel. So there's this combining work that's going on here. We talk about the combining of the messages quite extensively in our movement. This is what's being portrayed here 
in this passage. So in 1891, she's saying, we don't need to worry about the latter rain. All we have to do is keep our vessels clean so that when the angel of Revelation 18 comes down to unite with the third angel, um, then we'll be ready for it. Hopefully that we can see that. Um, Okay, so that's what I want to pick up from um, the early writings passage. Next, uh, come back to your notes. I have no specific time of which to speak when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will take place. Oh, sorry, what I didn't do, um, this is called the loud cry from early writings. I'm saying this event is the Sunday law. Again, I'd refer you back to the classes to show you the proof of why we're coming, why I'm making that assertion that the angel of Revelation 18 comes down here at the Sunday Law and he empowers the third angel's message. You can see exactly the same scenario in the Great Controversy, chapter 38, first paragraph. I have no specific time of which to speak when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will take place, when the mighty angel will come down from heaven and unite with the third angel in closing up the work for this world. My message is that our only safety is being ready for the heavenly refreshing, having our lamps trimmed and burning. Now that passage is taken from um, First Lecture Messages. Again, it's, I've got the date there for you. It's 1892. Um, This is a Review and Herald article, March 29th, 1892. Uh, um, I'm going to go back to the original and read that whole paragraph. It's not in your notes, unfortunately, because I didn't get time to put it into the notes. I just took it out of last day events. So the first bit is what you've got in your notes. I have no specific time of which to speak when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will take place, when the mighty angel will come down from heaven and unite with the third angel in closing up the work for this world, my message is that our only safety is being ready for the heavenly refreshing, having our lamps trimmed and burning. Christ has told us to watch, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Watch and pray is the charge that is given to us by our Redeemer. Day by day we are to seek the enlightenment of the Spirit of God, that it may do its office, its office work upon the soul and character. Oh how, many, oh, how much time has been wasted through giving attention to trifling things. Repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So she's quoting there from Acts chapter 3 verse 19. This was written in 1892. So I'm going to draw a little timeline here. Um, 1888, 1891 and 1892. And uh, this was March, March 29. Oh, if you go to the top of the page, um, in your notes, there's another reference, it's First Lecture Messages, page 191, this is also taken in the same year, 1892. We already read this, but I didn't point it out to you. The latter rain will come, and the blessing of God will fill every soul that is purified from every defilement. It is our work today to yield our souls to Christ, that we may be fitted for the time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, fitted for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So again, this is 1892, I don't have the month because I haven't um, checked that, but Alan White is unaware that the latter rain um, it has been poured out. She's still saying it's a future event. Just want us to see that. Now, I want to go to a, another passage. It's, this one is not in your notes, unfortunately. Um, this is taken from the Review and Herald, November 22nd, 1892. 
So that was March, and this is November. And if you were keeping up with the presentations yesterday, uh, as soon as we talk about November 22nd, it should prick your ears, because November 22nd is connected um, to November 9th, when you mix up the Julian and the Gregorian calendars. Um, so we, we know that it's a symbol of, of prophecy um, that, we're, that we're now addressing. This is in the year uh, 1892. So we've got some statements here that say we don't know when it's happening. And in November 22nd, a short while later, let's see what she says. Uh, let everyone who claims to believe, this is not in your notes, let everyone who claims to believe that the Lord is soon coming search the scriptures as never before. For Satan is determined to try every device possible to keep souls in darkness and blind the mind to the perils of the times in which we are living. Let every believer take up his Bible with earnest prayer that he may be enlightened by the Holy Spirit as to what is truth, that he may know more of God and of Jesus Christ whom he hath sent. Search for the truth as for hidden treasure and disappoint the enemy. So that's the introduction to the point I want to make. The time of test is just upon us. I'll read the passage then I'll go back and comment. The time of test is just upon us. For the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin pardoning redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. For it is the work of everyone to whom the message of warning has come to lift up Jesus, to present him to the world as revealed in types, shadows, symbols, as manifested in the revelations of the prophets, as unveiled in the lessons given to his disciples, and in the wonderful miracles wrought for the sons of men. Search the scriptures, for they are they that testify of him. So I'm just going to go back, and because uh, I read that relatively quickly, and just break down... Uh, the, the segment in the middle that I want us to see. It says the time of test is just upon us. And I'm suggesting that time of test that she's referring to is the Sunday law. And in this, it's this important event that we read about in early writings 277 paragraph 1. The time of test is just upon us for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. That word for, I understand to mean because. So let me paraphrase what I believe she's saying. We know that the Sunday law is imminently coming because something's already happened. And the because, it says, because the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. So, if this is the test, the Sunday law, she says, we know the Sunday law's coming because the loud cry has already started. If you take this model, you can see that it's at variance with this model. They're not the same model. Um, I'm just going to go back to that early writings passage just to show you because she's going to talk about the loud cry in that early writings passage. So we've laid out that the second angel comes down and joins with the third. I read that to you, these early writings 277 paragraph 1. The message of the fall of Babylon as given by the second angel is repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. So, this angel comes down at the right time as the third angel is, is going to begin to swell uh, to a loud cry. So this loud cry in the history of um, the latter reign is the swelling of the third angel's message and this second angel is the trigger for this event to begin. The people of God are thus prepared to stand in the hour of temptation which they are soon to meet. Um, that phrase, hour of temptation, 
is taken from, does anybody know? It's Revelation chapter 3 verse 10. Revelation chapter 3 verse 10 is the church of Philadelphia. And if you were to read the chapter, the, for me, the, the overarching theme of Philadelphia, besides the fact that it's a church that has no condemnation connected to it, is the subject of doors, doors being opened and doors being closed. And no man can interfere with the opening and closing of those doors. If you read um, the story of Philadelphia, that's, to me, the overarching theme that I get uh, from that. So when she, took, when she picks up this phrase, the hour of temptation, um, it says the people of God are thus prepared to stand in the hour of temptation. We already read earlier that the purpose of the latter rain or the refreshing is to prepare God's people for the second advent or for the plagues or for the harvest where there's this finished work. We know that this is the close of probation and because she's introduced Philadelphia into this story, um, or at least the concept of um, Revelation 3.10, we know that there's a shut door here. I think most of us are familiar with that. There's a shut door into the sanctuary. So you know that the hour of temptation is talking about this history here. Again, this is just review. We discussed this in class quite extensively and I think most people can see that, uh, agree with that. Um, which they're soon to meet. I saw a great light resting upon them and they united to fearlessly proclaim the third angel's message. Angels were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven and I heard voices which seemed to sound everywhere. Come out of her, my people, that ye be, my, that ye be not partakers of her sins. This is Revelation 18 verse 4. Uh, then she says this, This message seemed to be in addition to the third message joining it, the third message, as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message in 1844. All I want us to see, even though I'm not going to make any kind of application, is that this is 18, 1 to 3, and this loud cry is 18, verse 4. And you've got three angels all coming together in this history. You have the third angel, the second angel, and according to 18 verse 4 it says another voice. But in the passage that we've just read, Ellen White calls this multiple angels are coming down. If you were to read early writings, taken from Spiritual Gifts Volume 1, and you were to go to the chapter called The Second Angel's Message, back in Millerite history, um, I don't have a picture work of Millerite history here. If you went back to the Millerite history, you'll see the same dynamics. You'll see that the second angel's going to come down uh, on the first of the first month, and then it's going to be joined at midnight um, by these angels that join it, and their message changes, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. So there's a, a difference between the first angel and the second angel. The first angel is a singular angel, comes in 1798, it's empowered in 1840, but the second angel comes down April the 19th, 1844, but it's not empowered in the same way. The empowerment of the, third angel, of the second angel happens when other angels join that angel. Um, I don't profess to understand all the intricacies of that, um, but it is something that uh, I, I think we, we haven't really grappled with um, in our movement. Um, so all I wanted to pick up was here, the loud cry is a post-Sunday law experience and I believe that she's teaching us here that this loud cry has already begun. So uh, there's a discrepancy between those two models um, and I think the explanation is in, in, is in the text itself. Coming back to Review and Herald, November 22nd, 1892. Uh, this is paragraph 7, I don't think I gave you the paragraph. The time of test is just upon us, the Sunday law is just upon us and we know that because the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. So it talks about the glory of this angel that shall fill the whole earth. This is Revelation 18. But it says it's the beginning of this work. And what I want to suggest is if we come back to this model here, 
Um, remember we did a model of the Millerite history and then the history from 1798 onward and then our own history. I want to take this out and use the same framework. So this is, no, this is not going to be the line of Christ. This is going to come back to the Millerite line and this is the 144,000. We've got the second angel's message, the second angel's message, and you'll recall yesterday that I'm saying that this is the history of the first angel, and this is the history of the third angel. But the second angel came in this history, so I'm going to put the second angel here and doing this. So we've got the exact same scenario that we've said, this is the third time we're doing this pattern. And I want to go back and read the passage from Early Writings 277. I'm going to cut into the paragraph. The message of the fall of Babylon as given by the second angel is repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. So all I want to say is that Revelation 14 verse 8 comes in this history and I'm going to call this the arrival of the second angel and then it says in our history this is 18 verse 2 going to uh, 3 that this would be the empowerment and she doesn't use the word empowerment she just says repeated but what I want us to see it's not repeated like there's some gap here from here to here no, it's not that way. This second angel has been here, running through history, giving its message that Babylon is falling. It's a progressive fall. It doesn't say it in this passage, but I have another passage that talks about its fall being progressive. So I'm saying this story here is the story of the second angel's message. And as soon as we do that, of course, we're so familiar with Millerite history, we already know in the history of the Millerites there's both what? An empowerment and an arrival. And we read that right here out of early writings 277. I'll read this again. Um, Angels were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven and I heard voices which seemed to sound everywhere. Come out of her my people that ye be not partakers of her sins. So this was the modelling here of 18, 1 to 3 and 18, 4. But see how, what Ellen White says. She says, This message seemed to be in addition to the third message. Joining the third as the midnight cry joined the second angel in second angel's message in 1844. So all I'm showing you here is we use the phraseology of arrival and empowerment. They're just different terms to what Ellen White uses. This here would be the equivalent of this. And the arrival of the second angel uh, is Revelation 14. So this concept of an arrival in empowerment isn't something that we invented. It's straight out of the spirit of prophecy, and it's, so we can see that. So we've got this history here, arrival in empowerment. We have got this history, the arrival in empowerment, and we get both of these from one passage, the one we've just read. You can read the similar statement in the Great Controversy. So upon uh, one testimony, and the second testimony, we should expect to see the same dynamic in our history. We should expect to see a 2E and a 2A. So, what we're identifying in these two lines here, you saw um, that you've got 18.1, the loud cry is a post Sunday law experience, and here she says the loud cry has already started, and um, just so that we have that terminology correct. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. I'm saying that the loud cry has already started in this history pre-Sunday um, law and I'm going to mark it here in 1888. So here in 1888 uh, this is the angel of Revelation 18 that's already going to begin to do its work before the Sunday law comes. Uh, therefore making this the loud cry. 
Now, in this line, the loud cry is a waymark. It's a specific event which follows the Sunday Lord. They're two individual separate waymarks. But in this one, I'm just using it as a, an escalation or a period of time, just as this is showing, this dotted line. Ellen White says that it's the beginning of the work, and she also says, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. What I'm saying that is, uh, the revelation of Christ is a, a code word, if you like, for justification by faith. Uh, which is another code word for the nature of man. Now, this subject of the nature of man is not new to the 1888 history. It's been around for a long time. And I'll just read that passage for you. It's not, this is not in your notes as well. This is Test Minister Church, Volume 1, page 300, paragraph 1. So, 1T, 300.1. 1T, 300.1. It's volume one, it's at the very beginning of her work. <clears throat> the only safety now is to search for the truth as revealed in the word of God, as for hid treasure. The subjects of the Sabbath, the nature of man, and the testimony of Jesus are the great important truths to be understood. These will prove to be an anchor to hold God's people in these perilous times. But the mass of mankind despise the truths of God's word and prefer fables. And then she's going to quote from 2 Thess Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 and 12. So that was 1T 300.1. All I want to pick up is that she's picking up three separate subjects. Um, the Sabbath, the nature of man, and the testimony of Jesus. And I'm saying all of these are code words for a singular subject, which is the third angel's message. So, this had been introduced at the very beginning of our work. We'd lost track of a number of these truths, uh, particularly these two, and we'd focused upon the Sabbath, and because we'd lost these components of the third angel's message, it'd become a dry, dead message. And Ellen White talks about the messages become dry as the hills of Gilboa. Before we can get to the Sunday Law, Wagner and Jones are going to have to do some preparatory work, and this preparatory work that they're going to do is essentially to address the subject of the nature of man. And I'm suggesting that's what this is being brought, that's, that's being brought to view here. The Angel of Revelation 18, that it comes down, is marking this history in this fashion. <clears throat> so, if we were to get this concept and bring it back to this history here, 2E would be this one here. This would be the Sunday Law, and this one here, 1888, would be 9-11. I'm sure most of you have seen the calculation that's done. Um, I mentioned this yesterday, if you remember, Daniel chapter 5, meaning, meaning, tickle your fasting. I explained the reasoning of how we go from two 25-20s Sorry, two twelve sixties. We can break the line and we say that paganism and papalism are working hand in hand together. So it goes from twenty five twenty to twelve sixty. We're dealing with the remnant, so it becomes one hundred twenty six. And I showed you that began in eighteen sixty three and took you to nineteen eighty nine. You can do the same thing if you go from eighteen eighty eight. I know this is familiar territory for all of us. Um, and you go 126, and you get to the year 
um, 2014. So you can do that um, modeling and this 2014 is going to become a component of the line where we pick up the thunder. I already picked this up here in 2014. So 9-11 um, is what's going to be picked up through a similar story. I can't remember the start date now for this one uh, of 9-11. I'll pick it up for my, in my next presentation. But you can calculate to 9-11 um, back from Millerite history. And I'll show you the calculation for that uh, in our next presentation. So I'm saying the argument for 9-11 being the arrival of the second angel is based upon this methodology and it's the preparatory work that we need to bring us to the Sunday law just as it was in this history here. Now, the point I wanted to pick up here is that from Revelation 18, 1888 brings you to 2014. If this is the loud cry here, then this is also the latter rain. The latter rain is being poured out in this history and that's how you can connect 1888 with 2014 and make this the latter rain, which is what we did here earlier, if you remember. The latter rain here would be 2014, which we picked up from 1888. I just want to make one more observation. Um, I don't know if we were here with, in, or we've watched Sister Tessie's presentation. She brought up the year 1893. Don't know if we all remember that. And she used this same coding, uh, 126, and it brings you to the year 2019. Not sure if we all remember that. Um, if you went back one year, which is the year where all of this information is happening here, which is 1892, you get to the year 2018. And the story about 2018 is the subject here of this loud cry message. It's all being given here in 1892. And uh, you remember the date here, November 22nd. Um, if you went to page four, I'm not going to read page four and five. This is uh, take, taken out of Acts of the Apostles. Um, it explains, it's, it's, a, it's not a lengthy passage, uh, but it explains in a bit more detail how this former rain and latter rain modelling works. But we've already discussed that, I think, sufficiently, so I'm not going to uh, talk about that. So let me just summarise with, with, with what I'm saying. Um, we've used this agricultural cycle and we can lay out a uh, ploughing, a former rain, latter rain and harvest and we can use this in a number of different ways. One of the things that we need to grapple with is the subject of the day of the Lord. It's in two parts. Um, so I'm just going to say it now without defending it and hopefully as we go through, um, depending on how much time we have, I'll, I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. The day of the Lord here is the investigative judgment or the first part of the day and this is the executive judgment. If you go to the day of atonement which is the day of the Lord you can see that there's first the work of investigation and then there's a the work of execution. Um, I think we're all probably familiar with it, the close of probation where Michael stands up, he comes out of the sanctuary, closes the door we enter into a time of temptation, the seven plagues, and now the sins that were in the sanctuary are now going to be uh, removed from the sanctuary, carried by the priest, and they'll be transferred to the scapegoat. Um, I think we all understand that, um, the symbology of what all of that means. But what I wanted to point out here, again, I'm not going to make uh, any serious application about that, but the high priest 
who's doing that work of transferring from one place to another, from the curtain to the goat, he will not pay the penalty or he will not pay the price of those sins. Just wanted to point that out. It's the goat that pays the price. It's not the priest that pays the price. All the priest does, he's kind of like a, a transfer agent from uh, one holding place uh, to another. Everybody okay with that? That becomes an important part of our prophetic message when you, when you talk about the blotting out of sin and how the, how the investigative judgment works. So I just want to highlight that point because I think most of us are familiar with that. All I'm saying is that that's the work of execution. Now a fit man, symbol of the 144,000, is going to take that goat, put him into the wilderness and he's going to be there until he dies, which is a thousand years, and then he's going to be destroyed in the lake of fire. In real life, it doesn't work exactly the same way as the Day of Atonement, obviously. Um, but I'm saying the Day of the Lord is in two parts, first a work of investigation and then a work of execution. And it's based upon this concept here that it helps to define when the investigative judgment begins. So I'm saying the investigative judgment, this would be of the final generation, the living, begins here at the Sunday Law. And so what we need to do is develop a model, an idea, a concept of how um, we take this from the Sunday Law and bring it all the way back to 9-11, as we've taught for many years, to, to have a, an argument, a reasoned argument, of how we're going to do that. And it's the second angel that begins to open up uh, our understanding to how that works. I just want to read that uh, you had a second document. Uh, the reason why we're reading all these quotes is because um, a number of people have commented, complained, criticised, critiqued um, that I don't read enough inspiration, either enough Bible passages or enough Spirit of Prophecy quotes. And I just use logic and board work. Um, so I thought I'd take some time to read some Spirit of Prophecy quotes um, t to demonstrate that these models are not just plucked out of thin air, that they are based upon inspiration. <clears throat> Judgment of the Living. Great Controversy, page 435, paragraph 2. Um, just give me one second. Those who had accepted the light concerning the mediation of Christ and the perpetuity of the law of God found that these were the truths presented in Revelation 14. The message of this chapter constitutes a threefold warning, look to the appendix, which is to prepare the inhabitants of the earth for the Lord's second coming. So there are three angels' messages in Revelation 14 and these messages threefold warning, are designed to prepare the inhabitants of the earth for the Lord's second coming. And if we were to take that history just here, from the Millerite history all the way down, the first angel's message is to prepare you for what? The investigative judgment. The third angel's message is to prepare you for the executive judgment. So this idea of um, an investigative and executive judgment is already built into this model of uh, the Millerite history coming into our history. If you were to take that here and bring it into this history, the investigative judgment begins here and it goes all the way <coughs> down I'd have to mark it here to the close of probation. So that's the investigative judgment and then you get the investigative judgment, sorry the executive judgment and somewhere in this history, you're going to transition from the judgment of the dead to the judgment of the living. I think we're all familiar with that concept. The announcement, the hour of his judgment is come, points to the closing, wor 
sorry, the closing work of Christ's ministration for the salvation of men. When she says the hour of his judgment is come, where is she quoting from? It's Revelation 14, verse 7. Hope we can see that. Now, in the same book, she's going to teach that when the Millerites gave the announcement, the first angel's message, they were mistaken that it was dealing with um, the work of ministration because they were saying that it's the second advent. They were mistaken in that. So we want to understand what she says here. The announcement, the hour of his judgment is come, points to the closing work of Christ's ministration for the salvation of men. So is she talking about the third angel's message or the first angel's message when she says the closing work of Christ's ministration? You might read that it's talking about this event here, close of probation, but it's not. She's talking about 1844. It heralds a truth which must be proclaimed until the Saviour's intercession shall cease and, shall, and he shall return to the earth to take his people to himself. Can we see the phrase where it says, his intercession shall cease? The ceasing of intercession is here, the close of probation. And it says the message that proclaims the hour of his judgment is come must be given, this truth must be proclaimed until he finishes his intercession. I'm saying that's from 1844 all the way to the close of probation. It's the first angel's message that's going to be brought to view all through this history as you go from one generation to the next. The work of judgment which began in 1844 must continue until the cases of all are decided, both of the living and the dead. Hence it will extend to the close of human probation. Uh, that men may be prepared to stand in the judgment, the message commands them to fear God, give glory to him, and worship him that made heaven and earth, uh, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. Uh, the result of an acceptance of these messages is given in the word, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So, essentially all she's saying here is that if you want to stand in the judgment, that's this judgment here from 1844 to the close of probation, you need to go through this history here of the Millerites. So every single one of us needs to go through the Millerite history personally. That men may be prepared to stand in the judgment, the message commands them to fear God and give glory to him and worship him that made heaven and earth. The allusion here to worship him that made heaven and earth is dealing with the Sabbath. You can see that, I think, relatively simply. So that's why the Sabbath becomes a, a, a test here in October 1844 because they're now going to be prepared to accept the Sabbath and once you've accepted the Sabbath, given glory to God, now you're prepared to stand in the judgment. Next passage. Uh, Signs of the Times, May 29, 1884, paragraph 3. We are living in the great antitypical day of atonement. Jesus is now in the heavenly sanctuary making reconciliation for the sins of his people. And the judgment of the righteous dead has been going on almost 40 years. How soon the cases of the living will come in review before this tribunal, we know not. But we do know that when we are living in the closing scenes of... Sorry, but we do know that we are living in the closing scenes of Earth's history, standing as it were on the very borders of the eternal world. This is written in 1884. She marks 40 years. Um, let me just pick that up again. The judgment of the righteous dead has been going on almost 40 years. Uh, it's picking up from May, hence the almost. If you go back, it takes you to 1844. So in 1884, she doesn't know when the judgment of the living is going to begin. Um, there's a passage that's underneath that which is taken from uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 692, paragraph 1. And um, there's this discussion that she has here. And she's going to quote this uh, passage that we've just read. It says, several times during the past winter, 
1888 to 1889, I have met with the report that during the conference at Minneapolis, Sister White was shown that the judgment which, since 1844, had been passing upon the righteous dead, had now begun upon the living. She says this was a false report. So people were saying in 1888 that she was claiming that the judgment of the living had begun. And she says, no, that's a false report. It hasn't begun here in 1888. I never said that. So I only want to mark that point. But I want to contend that 1888 lines up with 2014. And 2014 lines up with this Sunday law here. And the Sunday law is the beginning of the investigative judgment of the living. So even though she denies that in that history, we find that it actually becomes the truth in our own history. Um, great controversy, this is the last one I, I wanted to read, it's on the next page, page two. Great controversy, page 490, paragraph one. GC 490, paragraph one. Solemn of the scenes connected with the closing work of the atonement, momentous of the interest involved therein. The judgment is now passing in the sanctuary above. For many years, this work has been in progress. Soon, none know how soon, it will pass to the cases of the living. In the awful presence of God, our lives are to, be cut, uh, to come up in review. At this time, above all others, it behooves every soul to heed the Saviour's admonition. Watch and pray, for you know not when uh, the time is. Mark 13:33. If therefore ye shall not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I come upon thee. When the work of the investigative judgment closes, the destiny of all, of all will have been decided for life or death. Probation is ended a short time before the appearing of the Lord in the clouds of heaven. All she's saying there is the close of probation is a little bit before the second advent. I want to tie in the, la the end of that first paragraph to the beginning of the second paragraph. She says, If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I come upon thee. Then she says, When the work of, investigate of the investigative judgment closes, the destiny of all will have been decided for life or for death. Probation is ended a short time before that. So if you don't know when these events are happening, you will fall foul of this passage, Mark 13, Revelation 3, which means you're not watching. So all I'm saying from that passage is that before the close of probation, when Christ comes as a thief in the night, you need to know the events that are happening so you can be prepared for this. I'm not sure if we read it earlier, I think we did. No one here on earth will know when the close of probation is going to happen. It's an event that happens in heaven. We don't have a marker here to say, oh, we woke up on this date and that was the close of probation. Some huge event happened. It happens when people are not aware. So the only way to know about when this happens is to be able to track the events that lead up to this. And I'm suggesting, based upon the subject of time that's now been introduced into our message, you can only track this with time. You can't track it with an event. And we discussed this yesterday, we discussed it in class quite extensively. When you go to uh, the uh, article, um, The Foundation of Our Faith, it's not the only place you see this, one selected message is 206.4. When she talks about the passing of the time, the passing of the time is a 2300 day prophecy, it's not the 2520. Because the passing of the time of 2300 days, you have a marker for if you're a Millerite. It's the destruction of the earth. But in reality, you don't have a marker for that. That's why you need Hiram Medsa to stand up and claim as a prophet that that event has actually happened. Because you can't work it out any other way. Um, the rest of that passage she just quotes from Revelation 22 verses 11 and 12 he that is unjust let him be unjust still he that is filthy let him be filthy still and that's the close of probation last paragraph in closing the righteous and the wicked will still be living upon the earth in their mortal state 
Men will be planting and building, eating and drinking, all unconscious that the final irrevocable decision has been pronounced in the sanctuary above. So if we can hold on to that thought, we'll talk about it in our next presentation. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks um, for the work that you have done through our lives. Lord, as you have led us along this path, we may have stumbled and fallen along the path, but you have raised us up. Father, often we have not fallen of our own volition or even our own carelessness, but we have been tripped up by our enemy. You have promised, Lord, even though a righteous man would be tripped up seven times, he would still arise and complete his journey. We thank you, Father, that you have brought us thus far. As we realise the, the nearness of our own um, probationary time ending, may each of us contemplate and sense the solemnity of the moment in which we live, not only here at this camp meeting, but even when we uh, depart and uh, go our various ways. As we see the work of the second angel, as we see its arrival and its empowerment in our own line, may the solemn reality of these truths have an effect upon our hearts and our minds that it hasn't done to this moment. Please be with us and please bless us, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.